I'm they becoming can be more tested. and more convinced that censorship is a tool of the devil. Yeah, that's I, what it is I would, because the uh, evil one likes to keep things hidden under a bushel basket. He likes to keep things in the dark. Yeah, and our Lord says, "What's things, done in the dark, we ought to bring things into the light because yeah. the light purifies." Yeah, and that's why freedom of speech is so important. Yeah, because it allows us to vet ideas. And we're back. I was going to say, don't say it. <laughs> don't say it. <laughs> it's going to be our thing. Put on a shirt and we're and back. And we're back. And we're back. I text, I was starting to tell the guys, Bobby texted me, so we're talking about the Eucharist today because <laughs> we're doing that sacrament series. And I text back, I'm in a ranty mood. That's not even a word, I don't think. But there's so much going on in the world. Yeah. It's like we, I'm going to give pat ourselves on the back a little bit. We've been a little restrained. In more recent episodes, yes. trying to do more catechetical type, yeah, educational type yeah. stuff, things that we love, right? We're talking about the sacraments. I'm enjoying those conversations. Yes, but for some reason, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed today, and I'm like, Yeah, I, I wake up like that every day, talk, ready to, <laughs> to. Well, I think it's important for us to use our faith to explore these things because other people, if we're thinking about them, then yeah. the people in the pews are thinking about them, and our friends, our family, they're thinking about it. So, how do we bring faith to that? <laughs> Bless you. Oh, thank you. You know, and that's... I, I totally agree with you because... I mean, it's important. We're not trying to be... I'm not trying to be... You're not trying to controversial. be provocative for the sake of being provocative no. or controversial. You're not chasing clicks. But you can't... Even if you restrict it, stuff still gets through. Like, I, I try not to spend a lot of time on social media, but when I do go on, you see stuff, you hear stuff. Yeah. Headlines, news articles... Stuff people are talking about in the office at home, yeah. and it's like it's mounting, and the just the insanity. And if you don't get the to talk about of chaos, it, chaos. If you don't let it out, it's going to explode some way or the other. Yeah, and not just let it out, but to let it out. Wow, the wind's really howling. Yeah. To let it out in the context of our Catholic faith, like to have yeah. that light and that perspective, is really important yeah. for me. And try to think about it. Like, that's what a, a dialogue is, is trying to get these ideas out and bounce them off each other. We don't have a script. We don't have anything written down. We'll text back and forth, like, these are some stories I saw, stuff like that. But other than that, we don't have any conversations about this. So it's literally in real time trying to unpack these things that we're thinking about, that it's yeah. in the news, that impacts all of us. I mean, the election's 25 days away, something like that. So things are ramping up. And the world stage, it's like you got Ukraine, you got the what's going on in the Middle East, you got what's going on with China, we got robots, you got like, it's like every day, like the news cycle goes so fast too. It's like by the time we catch a story, there's already three more stories. <laughs> it's crazy. It's, it, but it's interesting. It's, it's an interesting time to be alive. It is a very interesting, and I'm very grateful to be alive now because you get to see cutting edge advancements, but with that comes our ability to, how do we implement it? How do we, how do we use it in a moral and just way? And a lot of tension there. And uh, is that the, the wind is just crazy? Is that the Holy Spirit egging us on? Is that, is that God it, just like it's, coming yeah. upon the studio? It's, we got, I got the long sleeve shirt on. It's starting to get cold and yeah, it's hailing and, and windy. Yeah. And it's today. But the news cycle is if you take a step back and you look at it, it's, it's like it's you have one like of the simulation. It feels so weird. It's but so it's weird. turned up to like level five. It is so weird. It's it's so funny weird. Like every day, like if you just stop and think, like today alone, like listen to the Trump. Dude, in the last two months, a presidential candidate yes. was shot at twice. A president you, steps down. You, a president steps down. A new uh, person steps in. There's war breaking on the Middle East again. Yeah, we got robots. Where do these Where do these robots come from, dude? They're making drinks. They literally copied after the movie I Robot, and that doesn't end well in the movie. It's like they literally no, designed no. the cars, the taxi, and the thing. <laughs> the guy from the guy from the movie I Robot said yeah. Elon Musk stole his idea. That's how close they look. Optimus, uh, the robots, and then the, even the taxi and the van. They like they look a lot uh -huh. like the movie with Will Will Smith. So it's like we're living in a weird. This it's weird like every day. How, it's like somebody's sitting there. How can we top yesterday? Yesterday. Yeah. We Elon got Musk is sending rockets and catching the rocket it that comes with the back. tower. Like, that's just mind blowing. I don't think people appreciate, for the most part, no. I mean, people that know or are in that space can appreciate it. The fact that we were able not just to bring a rocket back, but to catch it the way they did. Yeah. It's like every day I'm looking at something. 
that's just mind blowing. It's uh, and he's not getting, and he's get get not blown. getting the credit that he deserves no, because no, no. of his political leading, yeah. and that's part of why we want to talk about these things. Is that like wherever you're at on the political spectrum, like free speech is a good thing. It's good that Elon Musk, whoever he supports. If he was supporting Democrats, like, hey, get out there and talk about it. Like, let's not censor people. Let's get the ideas out there and let them free flow. And you don't want people with bad ideas hiding because they're mostly conspiratorial. And then people, if you start to censor them, then what do they do? They go underground. Then you can't see what they're up to and what they're doing. Like, let people who have bad ideas, put those bad ideas out there and let those be judged by other people. Like, okay, well, that's not good. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? And if they're just going to attack and attack, you can mute and block those people, but at least you see what they're doing. Like when I get weird and, and worried about are people who like you kick them off, then, then they're, they're already paranoid. So then now, yeah, they're after me. It's a conspiracy. Now they're underground because they're really paranoid. It's like you're just feeding into that self-fulfilling prophecy with these people. And then you, they go underground. Then you know what's going on. It's like let bad ideas go out there so that they can be I'm they becoming can be more tested. and more convinced that censorship is a tool of the devil. Yeah. That's I, what it I is because the uh, evil one likes to keep things hidden under a bushel basket. He likes to keep things in the dark. Yeah. And our Lord says – What's things, done in the dark – we ought to bring things into the light because yeah. the light purifies. Yeah. And that's why freedom of speech is so important yeah. because it allows us to vet ideas. Yeah. We have to return to civil discourse, yes, because civil discourse allows us to have an exchange of ideas. We can't so be married to our ideas that they define our identity because our identity ought to come only from Christ. But when we allow our ideas to define our identity, no. then we're manufacturing our identity different than that which our Heavenly Father has created us in. And that's the sin of Adam and Eve. We want to create the identity for ourselves. Yeah. We want to have our beliefs. We want to be anchored to a reality that we construct for ourselves. And if we do that and we allow for censorship to creep in where we're blocking those things that make us uncomfortable or, or what have you, then we're, we are distancing ourselves from the truth and we know the truth to be God. So you're distancing yeah. yourself from God. You're distancing yourself from who God wants you to be. So, I mean, the more I see like this stuff play out, yeah. The more it's like these, these are the tricks of the evil one. Yeah, well, just the term dialogue, we've talked about that before, dialogos, which means having a, a participation with the logos, like getting it out there and talking it out. And what happens when people aren't free to talk about ideas? Well, then words are violence or words can hurt people. And then if you get censored, like then the only next thing that people do is like they – like they want to use violence. Like the, we, our ideas should be put out in the marketplace so that our ideas die versus us and other people. Like, hey, your ideas aren't you. They come from, you know, within from God, we believe that, you know, that those ideas come out. But if we don't get them out there, there's no difference between free speech and freedom of thought. Because most of the time, most people, if you're just thinking within your head and you don't write it down, you don't verbalize it, it never really gets captured. You don't really think that much about it. Like, but how we express it and make it, call it out into to words, it becomes actualized and how we talk about it. Same with writing. So if we can't actually verbalize our ideas with other people, it's like, how can we ever move anything forward? And it's that important, that, that balance of people bouncing those ideas off of each other to like, hey, maybe that part is wrong. Like us talking back and forth. We don't push back a lot, but there are some things that we disagree on and we push back, but then it's like, okay, and then it makes me think about that. And then instead of straw manning the arguments, like a lot of people now, they call it steel manning the arguments. Okay, well, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. I want to try to help you strengthen your own position yeah. so I can better strengthen my position. We shouldn't be trying to just straw man, take down these these you know, people's ideas, try to say, okay, well, maybe there's something to that, or maybe I can even get a nugget out of that to help strengthen my own position or try to help you realize, see the faults in your own position versus attacking you as a person and things like that. And I think that's why it's important with Twitter. That's why I don't understand why so many people are upset about it. It's like, there's not a whole lot of places to get free exchange of ideas, whether you agree with them or not, just where the information could be out there. And then, like I said, if the ideas are bad, then people don't like them or they, they will and they'll tell you they're, they're not good, but just saying... No, that you can't say your idea because I don't agree with it. It's just not. It's just not American. I don't think, or Christian for that matter. Your lung capacity is amazing. I, hey, I used to play. I, I used to play trumpet. <laughs> I'm just looking I, at I, you I like oh, this trumpet. guy's just rolling. I've been working. I've been right working now. on my breath work as well. Every morning, I'm doing breath work. Yeah. Are you picking up the trumpet again? I tried. I'm not very good because yeah. uh, Father Declan had said something about he played trumpet in the, the conference. And I'm like, I was first chair of trumpet. I still have my trumpet. <laughs> and I, I was down in the basement a couple of days ago. I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I was blaming the trumpet. It's the trumpet. 
But I'm not like I thought back. I'm like, I did get it tuned up like five years ago. I'm like, no, yeah. it's just me. <laughs> but I've been working on my breath. Bre uh, Gary Brecca, you familiar oh, with yeah. him? Breathing exercises? Yeah, do it. I've been doing those in the morning. I do I do it with the Jesus prayer. You yeah. know, doing the seven times through where you do four breaths in, hold it for four seconds, four seconds out. You Are do they it seven times. It's awesome. I mean, it, well, they, what he believes and I, what I believe is like oxygen is how, you know, it's what's in your blood is what goes through your body, but disease is lack of oxygen. And so many of us are mouth breathers. Most people don't intentionally take in deep Wait, breaths. say that again? Day. Most of us breathe in through no, our no, mouth. No, disease thing. That disease is a lack of oxygen, oxygen and your blood is oxygen. So people aren't getting enough oxygen like throughout their whole body. That's why he's big on the breath work. It's like the way that the body, I don't want to go too deep down the health, the health stuff, but there is a lot of things within our body between the environment and, and and all these different things that we take in from plastics and candles and scented stuff. We're not getting proper, we don't breathe properly, part of it. But the other thing is the environmental factors that is also helps cause it. I have asthma, so I have to, I work, actively work on my breathing, but it's, it's important. It's like, it's the breath of life. Like there's a reason why God, the pneuma, the, the spirit of God is the, the breath of God. Like he literally breathed into us and that's how we got life and it's how we inspire is how we expire and how, you know how those words are connected to be inspirational and things like that it's by no you know it's an important thing it's the lifeblood you, you think about it most of us just live breathing recycled air yeah. all the time in you, indoors you're indoors and breathing most people air. spend 93 percent of their day indoors and to get to that recycled air you just breathe it in fumes on your way to work and you're breathing it through your mouth not you through your nose yeah it's like, it's not the same thing. Like you're meant to breathe with your nose because it filters everything that goes through your nose. It filters. You're not supposed to, like mouth breather is like a, you know, derogatory term. You call somebody a mouth breather, yeah. but that's, that's like, now there's a new company. They have this. Yeah. Uh, Mike, do you still use the tape? The tape I, on your mouth? I, I tape my mouth every night plus yeah. the strip because I have a deviated system, a septum. So yeah. I do a mouth breathe and I snore. But ever since I've yeah. started doing that, I mean, but you feel, feel a lot good, better. You better feel a lot sleep, better. But, everything, yeah. really? Yeah, and you don't got to so, do a ton of breath work. If you do five minutes a day, start with just do. Try to do. Try to sit still and be quiet and pray and meditate and just breathe. Yeah. It not only. I was just talking to a guy because I told a guy about this last week. He goes, "Hey, I did what you told me to do." I said, "What was that?" I'm like, "Oh, because I talk a lot." <laughs> so he goes, "He goes, I had to do an MRI, and he's like, I didn't really get claustrophobic, but my back was really hurting." And he said, "I took your advice on how to do the breathing stuff," and he's like. It's like, I, man, I felt great. I'm like, I was like, I started, do, I've been doing it every day. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, because it's, it, it's like. Now you got so, me. Now I'm conscious. Like, am I breathing through my nose or my mouth I'm right telling now? you, you don't. <laughs> Most people don't breathe I through their nose. I catch myself all the time just like. Yeah, we oh. just mouth breathe. It's easier because it's a lazy, it's a lazy, like it's a shallow breath. We're not taking deep breaths at all. But that's also like the Navy SEALs, what they do. So that's how they train it. They call it box breathing. It's the same thing. It's like you do four seconds in. Yeah. I've, I've Hold it that. for four seconds and then slow down. And if you can, because it's such an involuntary thing that we do that we don't think about it because we're thinking about doing other things. But when you do slow down your breath, that helps slow down your blood pressure. You can take it down. You got bad anxiety. You're having stress. There's nothing better than stopping and, and praying. But as yeah. Christians, we take our breath and match it up with prayer. Like that's what the monks, that's what the mystics have always done. It's like you can reach these states of euphoria by practicing breath work. You know, it's a, it's, it doesn't have to be a prayer, but you can make it a prayer and yeah. it also help you, your health at the same time. So check out breath work, try it. I'm curious, how, how long did it take you, Mike, to acclimate to the tape on the mouth? Uh, Cause I could see that being was, like asphyxiating. It was a little weird at first, but I mean, once you, once you learn how to breathe, like, like Bobby's talking about, it's kind of indifferent. I mean, like Bobby said, we're meant to breathe out of our noses, so your body just kind of kicks into to knowing how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, I don't know, at, at first, maybe the first two nights, it was a little weird having something on your mouth. And there were a couple of times where I was like, oh man, I can't get a full breath. But if you just force yourself, eventually it's just gonna, your, yeah. no, your nasal passes just open up and you'll be fine. I mean, it works, yeah. So I do it every night now. And it, oh, that's cool, my yeah. luck, I'd pass out while I'm sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you snore bad? You need like a sleep pad machine. I have to ask Dima. I don't think I snore. Well, that's a big deal. If you do sleep apnea, I wake up it? refreshed. Like okay, I don't, that's good because a lot typically of typically people, people that snore or they need you a sleep. Wake pad? up with your mouth closed or open usually. Like if you think about that, because usually that's the first telltale sign. Like if you're waking up and your mouth is dry and nasty and like you have your mouth open when you're you know waking up, then it's usually you breathe through your mouth. I don't know. But even I before. 
<laughs> so <laughs> what I, it is really good to do. So I do it right when I first wake up, but it's also great to do it right before you go to bed. So laying in bed, go through your exam and go through what you're doing. And literally just do, if you do that, do the four breaths, do, do that four seconds in, do, do that, do that seven times. Guaranteed within two seconds, you'll be out, you're sleeping. Because your body ha feels you're getting all the oxygen. If you have a hard time sleeping, do the breath work before you go to bed. You'll be out in two seconds. As soon as I do them, I'm already asleep. It's crazy how it works. It's like I, you get so relaxed because you're you're taking down your, you know. But Halo has a really good uh, sleep meditation. I would do that uh, sometimes too, but I don't make it through like the first three minutes. I'm, three mm -hmm. minutes, I'm out. But it's like, you know, Jonathan Rumi, like getting you to relax. So, like You start with your feet. You tense up your feet. And you let them go. You tense up your calf muscles, and then you like you tense it up on purpose. Yeah. And then you're like, feel I don't like do the hollow thing, but I do that exercise. Yeah, it works. I awesome. started in seminary, and yeah, I really and then it goes the same with it. you know, then then doing your, your breath, trying to to slow down your breathing, yeah. slow down your heart rate, and then boom, next thing you know, night night time. So how do we get on breathing? I, don't I have know. no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm We're, trying to find an angle to bring us back, but we just have to it's hard cut. That's it. Hard, hard cut, cut it. And go into something. So what what thing has uh, in the news? Speaking of things that tense me up. Yes. Uh -oh. That's so what I was going to get to. Here's my transition. <laughs> we were at church, not this past Sunday, but the Sunday before last at an unnamed, undisclosed location <laughs> nearby. Were you doing recon or are you just? In... <clears throat> no, we were just going to church. And dude, we just have to get better. Like, generally speaking, yeah. we have to get better at the art of the mass. That was something that was really big in my seminary formation. Um, and I, I, I'm sure different seminaries, when different formators, you know, they, they they have their preferences. Everybody has their preferences, and so they'll they'll highlight or they'll emphasize different things. The the priest that was in charge of our formation, liturgical formation, was just phenomenal. And he was really big on, like, the priest being the, uh, uh, what they would say in Latin, Ars Celebrandi. Like, he he was the one that led the art of celebrating worship because it, there's an art to it. It's not, yeah, there's a rubric, there's yeah. there's a formula that you follow, but th there there's an artistic perspective to the mass, yeah, that's and what Shia LaBeouf. Of the that's what Shia LaBeouf said when he talked to Bishop Barron. That's what he how he described it. Well, he how said did he do that? That it was like an art, like when he went it to is. when he went to a traditional Latin mass with that one that was very reverent, where somebody went through the rubric, like it was like done, like he felt like it was an art. Like Father Maletta is really it. big on this, and uh, it's something that's kind of it's it's infused our vision for worship here at SJE. So. His, well, his vision is, and this is something I endorse and support. It's like you want to start the mass on a high note, right? You want the energy up. So we actually we start with the energy solemn, reverent. You're entering a sacred space, and we have the the privilege. Recently, we installed a lighting system, so we actually dim all the lights in the house. We dim all the lights in the church, God's house, and so you enter, and the light is just focused on the tabernacle because that's where we want your attention. And so that's where the art comes in. It's manipulating the environment so that, like with breathing, you're using the physical world to trigger your mental, emotional, and spiritual state, right? You're, yeah. uh, you're awakening yourself to a new reality. So you come in this church. It's solemn. We sing the Veni, right? Come Holy Spirit. And again, this solemn entrance into this liturgical action that is a community we're going to celebrate. And then as Mass is going to start, boom, lights go up. It's high energy because we're, we're here to celebrate. Right, as a community, we've been in our corners doing our thing all week. Now we're here. It's Sunday. It's Saturday. Wherever you are, it's Sunday. We're here to celebrate. So high energy, lights go up, music goes up. You're standing up, like David dancing around the ark. There's joy, right, that we get to crack open God's word and receive Him fully in the sacrament of the Eucharist. And so there's this again, ebb and flow down, yeah. to the mass. Yes, and so you start kind of reverent, then you build up. And then you've got the opening of God's word, right? And so you're you're kind of on this holding, right? You're receiving pattern. And then the priest delivers the homily. And the homily, depending on what the topic is, what the readings are, what he's trying to convey, that in itself, it's not just like this monotone delivery. I mean, sometimes, and God bless our deacons, because they don't get the chance to exercise the craft, the art, as often as priests do. And formation goes into that too in personality. Yeah. 
right? Because not everybody's a public speaker. You can work at it, but there's some people like they just have it. Like they have the the natural ability to deliver publicly. But sometimes they'll come up and they'll just read off of a text. Like you're losing people. I mean, I, I can stay in it because I know what I'm here for, but you're losing people. So there's an art to delivering the homily too. Like you have to be engaging. You've got to be, you're not here to entertain, but you're here to engage. There's a difference there's between a difference. entertaining and engaging. And so you want to engage the people that are there. Not that this is your work, but it's through your 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 your, your gifts and your strengths. The Holy Spirit's working. You're allowing through. the Holy Spirit to work in the people, right? You're keeping them in that moment, and that's like what what Shia LaBeouf. I'm sure I didn't hear that part, but as an actor, I mean, that's he understands what he resonated that fully. With yes, like a movie, and, there's moments where they yeah. want to capture you, yeah. right? Because they want to convey a feeling or an emotion or something. We want to capture you in this moment, yeah. so that the Holy Spirit, who is the presider is able to speak a word to you, right? You're able to give you a gift of grace. And so you come out of the homily and then you go into the prayers of the faithful, right? Again, there's an art to it. And then you move into the Eucharistic liturgy, right? So the preparation of the altar. Again, there's a celebratory, like we're preparing the altar, but then it gets solemn again. Right? And so we dim the house lights, yeah. right? Because now you're actually, you're re-entering into the moment of Calvary, right? Our Lord's sacrifice, and so there's this solemnity that should take over the congregation. So there is this like intentionality to the mass. And if you do it well, the mass is captivating. Yeah. You don't, you're not looking for entertainment, but I go to some places and it's like, wow, you guys haven't given thought to this. I mean, I, I'm not saying that you're not being intentional in what you're doing, but have you given thought to the art of what it is you're trying to do? Have you given have thought? Have you put yourself in the audience and see what it'd be like for somebody to put your into their shoes to, mm -hmm. to, to watch it and see. And so they lose that sometimes. Like, yeah. What is it like to be somebody who's at one of your masses? We went to so we went to this mass, and there's two things that just like it was your kind of your typical Catholic mass experience uh, on the on the I don't want to say negative end of the spectrum because that has negative connotation, but it wasn't it wasn't capturing. It wasn't enthralling. Um, it felt like you were just going through the motions, but two things that stood out, dude, when I started counting the number of petitions that they had, when I started counting, cause I'm standing there thinking like, oh, these are going long. <laughs> and then I started to count. I counted six. It must've been like 15 petitions, dude. Now I'm here to pray, but this isn't good Friday where we have a litany of petitions. The point of the petitions and the, again, there's rubrics that tell us like what, how the petitions ought to be ordered. You don't want any one point of the mass to overtake the mass. You don't want any one point of the mass to disrupt the, the celebration of the mass, that, that movement of the mass. And when you take the time to, to offer up 15 petitions, I mean, the, the person that was up there giving the petitions stopped. And you usually know it's like, okay, this is the last one because we're praying for the dead. That's as final as it gets. And then the priest started chiming in and I'm like, oh, father, come on, just do a better job of like, these are going to be our petitions for today. If father has something on his heart and sometimes like they'll say, you know, in the, and it's true in the moment, the Holy Spirit might inspire them, but you didn't say anything original. Like that could have been planned ahead. Yeah. Combined. Yeah. yeah. And so like that took me out of the mass experience or again, you're prolonging this segment of the mass that isn't meant to be prolonged. St. Uh, Pope Benedict talked about this a lot right? No one part of the mass should overpower other parts of the mass. The other thing that just got me, dude, and this happens more times than not, we have to get better at the announcements, right? The final blessing isn't there to keep people hostage until you've gone through the announcements. Because again, God bless her, this lady comes up and she's going through this like Again, litany of announcements. It's like your pancake breakfast here. Bingo yeah, she's this just night. reading the bulletin to us. I'm like, it's in the bulletin. Like, and the way she was delivering them, it was just so monotone and again, kind of stereotypical. Who are you talking to? Like, nobody's being, if you want to look at it from a marketing perspective, nobody's being drawn in and attracted to what it is you're trying to invite people to by saying, you know, she just, ladies. Make sure you stop by the table and get your ticket to the and and it just went on and on and on and I'm like God, just give me the blessing, please. Like that's that's. It shows me a sign of like, like 
they're focused on things that are not meant to be focused on. Yes, we need to have announcements and things like that. I get it. But I think a lot of churches who realize that that's not the proper time, it really does take away from the experience of the Mass, talking about secular things that are in the narthex or, or out there about, you know, it's like you're making it a marketplace. It's all about buy this thing and the candy sale and a bake sale and a bingo and don't forget your raffle tickets. Don't forget Knights of Columbus are here. And the, the, it's like, I've been to some masses where it's like, I won't go back there now because it's that distracting to me that somebody gets up there to talk and then they set, they start like the one time the guys like started giving like a little like mini, mini homily. homily yeah. I'm like, are you serious? Like he's seriously like, Oh yeah. And today's this and this, I'm like, and he's going on and on. I'm talking 10 minutes and he, and then he sits back down. I'm like, was that? It's like there, there is a sacredness to the thing. So I think SJE, once in a while, we'll, we'll have announcements, but for the most part, they do a weekly update. Uh, yeah. You guys do a great job of doing, sending out a YouTube video because a lot of people, uh, you know, statistics have been out. I saw people want to get information. Their first 55% of people said the way that they want to receive information is via a video. Second would be an email. You know, it's like, so like, yeah. And then you have the bulletin. It's like, I don't have to go through and read it. It's like, hey, it's in the bulletin. Like they're handing it to you on the way out. Like everyone looks through it, even though they may throw it away, but they at least glance at it, see what's going on. You know, the, the, again, I keep harping back to intentionality, yeah. being strategic because you only keep attention span for so long. And my, again, I want to keep harping on, there is a beauty to the intentionality with which the mass has developed over the years. And I'll go to like Orthodox, Orthodox services, Eastern Catholic services, They'll go for two hours, right? I'm not I'm not opposed to being in church. Longer. Longer, doing the things of church, being immersed in the ritual. But when you do things that are superfluous to the ritual, that takes away from the ritual, it just, and then you use things like the final blessing to keep me captive. Because I'm not going to do the, like you say, the Judas shuffle yeah. out before I get that blessing. And I want that blessing because that blessing not only seals my reception of the Eucharist because it ends the Eucharistic liturgy, but that blessing carries me through. It's my actual sending out. It's the sending out of the congregation to be blessed, to go forth, to be disciples who make disciples. I mean, it has intention. But when you get up there and you just throw everything at us, well, then you're not promoting anything. You can't get up there and give us two pages of announcements because you just diluted your ask, right? You only have so, they call it donor fatigue. There's only so many asks you can make of people and if I get up there but and I give you 12 asks, I'm just, I just zoned out. I'm not, I don't want to yeah. be a part of this. Give me one ask. Limit it, limit it to three. Like these are going to be the three asks. These are the three things we want people to be involved in this week. All right? And they could be reoccurring. Maybe it's like this month we got a, we got a festival going on or we got a food drive. Next month we're, we're serving 1,000 meals for Thanksgiving. So that's going to be our ask. We're going to make sure that people know this is where we want you to get plugged in because it's going to be the biggest return on your investment of yeah, time, talent, sense. and treasure. Yeah. So limit it so you're more effective. Yeah. But it's like we throw everything at people, and at the end of every announcement, it's like, see the bulletin for more detail. Well, you could have just said that at the beginning. Yeah. Two things off of what you, what you had said. Uh, the first one is that, so don't get discouraged if that's your experience at your local parish. You know, if you can't get involved some way to like be on a leadership team or try to help, you can't just go and, hey, father, that was boring and it stunk. Like, that's not nice either. You know, there's some way to get oh, involved, no, no, no. To, to reach through somehow. And I hope I'm not coming across no, this way. No, no, but I'm, I'm saying, just really but I'm passionate saying because about this. I know because, but because there are people I'm sure listening and I know of experience it where that's your parish. It's like, and I don't want to just jump ship because I want to go somewhere that's more engaging or better, but like, because I have roots here and I love it here. So finding ways to be constructive and some ways to be proactive to try to help make it better. You know, sometimes it just starts by you just asking questions, not even not condemning them. Like, hey, hey, hey why do we do this this way? And just get them to think about it. So trying to, don't get discouraged because some of the, the those masses where it doesn't feel like you're getting engaged, doesn't feel like you're getting much from it, those could be some of the best masses because you're not there for what God can give you. You're there for the right reasons. You're there for God even though it's boring, even though this guy drives you nuts, the announcements stink, the petitions go on forever. Yeah. feels like I'm a hostage, but I'm, I'm not here for any of that. I'm here for God. Well, so here's the reality, so, though. Yeah, to try I to agree with way. what you just said. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be that way. Here's the reality, yeah. though. We live in a very mobile, 
age, yeah. right? We we said earlier, like yeah. this. There is should a, be no reason for that this day and age. No, yeah, I mean, I trying to get better. Can, people well, should here's be working thing, on getting people, better. and we were very transitory, especially the our generation and and yeah. and, and below. It's you, you, older generations. They're they're very much tied to this is our parish, yeah. and that's there's a beauty in that, right? They've raised the family in this parish. They've been a part of this community. They're, they know the people. They're comfortable here. There's a beauty there. They're, they're the cornerstones of a community. But then you've got other generations that they have this kind of experience. Just know that they're going to pick up and go somewhere else because fortunately we still live in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area where it's not that hard to go to another Catholic church to have another mass experience if that's what you're looking for. Yeah. So just to be mindful of what, is what I'm doing drawing people in, attracting people, engaging people, captivating people, yeah. or is what I'm doing driving people away is what I'm doing causing people to think twice about coming back. Yeah. I mean, and those I'm, should be real considerations. It, and then you evaluate should, what you're doing against sh- that. It should be just like if you're in a business, I mean, not that we're there trying to run a business, but you should be thinking of it just like it's that serious. Like, are you trying to get better at what you're, you're doing? Like whether that's your personal life, whether that's doing church, whether that's doing ministry, like are we learning from things like, hey, are people coming? Are they engaged? Are they not? Are they sitting on their hands? Are they, like you can know, like, is this mass engaging or not? You can by look by people. Are they checking their watch? Are they not paying attention? Are they like not singing? Are they like all these things are going in? It's like, what's do you want to be a better church? Like, or you there's a lot of people just want to mail it in and just go through the motions. And I get it, people get burnt out and things like that. But if that's you and you're you're the pastor. It's like, okay, well, I know we're not here to entertain, but we can definitely, there's a lot of people falling away. Like, what are we doing about that? That's why I love SJE. And, you know, before we came here, we're focused on trying to have like a divine renovation, trying to do these different things to try to be better, try to be, you know, other minded. We're not, not thinking about us, but like, how can we, if you were a stranger, you walked in this church, how would you be received? How would the, how's the music? How does the grounds look? Is there garbage everywhere. Like, how are the grounds when you walk in? How are the people? How are the Eucharistic? How are the ushers? Are they being rude? Like, are they talking? Are they distraction? You know, it's like all these different things. Like, but it takes intentionality to make things good. Just like in your own life. If you just get up every day and just, just be who you are and you don't, you're not intentional about like, Hey, meeting my wife. And when I go from work to give her a kiss and get her a hug and make the bed for, or do like those things, like my marriage is going to stink. Like you got to go out of your way to have a good relationship. And that goes same with us. You you can't just take us for granted because people aren't just showing up. So the people are there. Are we putting forth the effort to say like, we appreciate you're taking an hour out of your week. I know a lot of people aren't doing that. So are we being good stewards of your time to be here? Yeah, it's for God. But at the same time, this is a reciprocal relationship. Like, like, yeah, I'm working on my, you know, I, I, as a parishioner, I need to be doing what I should be doing. I should be coming in. I should know the readings. I should be engaged. But like, are you holding up your end? And it's a, it's a give and take both. And I think that's, that shows a parish you that do, cares. You do hear, if, if you're, if this is something that you're interested in, you do hear um, the criticism that, you know, church shouldn't operate like a business. Church is different than a business. Uh, it's, and I, in one sense, I get it, but I... Yeah, not the money part, but the other thing else that you're held... Well, no, no, here's what I'm going to well, say Well, you to still that. need... The, yeah, yeah, but people will give if they become a disciple. What does it mean to operate money. as a business? It means to be a good steward, really. It, to be a good steward, exactly. And so I forget which pope said this. He said it about coffee. Like, we ought to baptize coffee and make it... Like, a coffee at one point was... Uh, like this is a, it's a drug, it's a this, it's a that, and then he tried it, and it's like no, we have to baptize this and take it for ourselves. Yeah. It's like that's that's true of anything in this world. We baptize that which is good in culture, and so business principles, if they're effective, yeah. we baptize them. We add a pastoral dimension to them, and we adopt them in order that we are more effective in mission. And so, yeah. I I love like. We've talked about this so many times. I love looking at visionaries like Steve Jobs and what they did with Apple, for example. Right? Yeah, right. I got the the pad in front of me and the watch on my wrist, so it's a, right. It's something easy to turn to. They're so intentional. If you go buy an Apple store, they're so intentional by how the store is laid out. It's yes. what can we learn from that as church, right? It, it's not that we're trying to diminish the the reverence and the sacredness with which we hold the sacraments. But as, as, a, as an exercise, if you were to think of church as a product, because people are being sold stuff all the time, we're competing for people's most valuable commodity, which is their time and their attention, right? We want your soul. 
right? For, for Christ. But we're, to get there, we have to compete for your time and your attention. Yeah. So if you think of it, again, just as an exercise, a thought exercise, if church does operate in that capacity, then look at the intentionality with how the most successful businesses approach the most minuscule mundane things, like the layout of their stores. You go into an Apple store, the first thing they have in every Apple store, yeah, they've got the, the signage, which is very clear, very crisp. It doesn't overwhelm. It's like, bam, one poster, right? They got their products right there uh, at the front of the store because they want you to come in. They want you to start touching stuff, right? Yeah. And touching stuff, it's always the smallest things, usually the phones. And then they move you up to the tablets and then they move you up to the computers, right? They move you up to the bigger things because, oh, this was cool. And then they ladder you into the store. Oh, I'm going to take the next step. I'm going to take the next step. And it's all very intentional. Inviting. And yes, it's warm. It's inviting. It's captivating. Look at how your church is laid out. And maybe this is the church that you're in. And this is where you could offer feedback if you're not on the leadership capacity. Sometimes you walk into a church and they just hit you with everything. Pro-life poster here, vocation poster here, brochures here, pamphlets here. Most of them are dusty. That should be a signal for you that like it's not effective marketing. Just because yeah. Susan, God bless her, is really passionate about basket weaving. Susan from Parish Council. Yeah, it doesn't. That, yeah, that's one of my favorite Twitter accounts <laughs> forever. Oh. It doesn't mean that like we have to have it at the front door. Be intentional about how you engage yes. people, right? So business principles. We shouldn't just say like, okay, no, that's corporate. That's business. We're not going to, and if you let that mentality seep into how you do things while still maintaining that pastoral dimension, man, we're going to be so much more effective. Yeah, imagine if the pastor didn't perform, he got fired. You know what I'm saying? It's not that way, but I'm just saying, but what if his job depended on the fact that he gave great homilies, he was a great leader, everything was great. You know, there, there, there needs to feel like that interior pressure, like, no, God put something more important than a job. It's a vocation. It's, yeah. it's, it's important that I'm in charge of this geographical region that is my parish. I'm in charge of not just the people that come here, but every person's soul. And if you took that personally, like that was your own, your own soul, your own money, if that was your business, you know what I'm saying? If we, if we take it that serious, like it's that serious. It's like, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who aren't taking it that serious. And there's people have a lot of options. Yeah. A lot of people not just leave, they leave the Catholic faith to go to, to a church where they feel like, hey, it's intentional. Hey, you know. But the largest group of evangelicals is former Catholics. Yeah. And they, what do they always say? I don't feel like I'm being fed. Yeah. No one, you know, I, I feel like I'm not being seen or, hey, I wasn't engaged. I wasn't, you know, but I think that we, don't have to throw all the beauty of the mass out. We have that there, but there's a way to do mass that incorporates, like you said, the the joy and the reverence at the same time. It's not, that was the second part I want to say is that we hear from the traditional side of the Catholics is that it's just Calvary. The mass is just reverent, be sad almost. Like we're at, you should be almost crying because you're at the cross. Like that's half of the mass. Yes, when it gets time to liturgy of the Eucharist and we're transforming that space and 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 the Eucharist should be reverent. I, I agree. But it's also the wedding supper of the lamb. It's also supposed to be joyous. It's like I've been to a lot of weddings. I've ripped my pants at weddings. I'm dancing. I'm having a good time. I don't know too many weddings where people are not have, are not smiling or not full of joy. Like joy, it needs to be a, we're a both hand church. Mm -hmm. So we need to have the reverence and the intimacy. We need to have the joy and the, the awe, the, like, there's a miracle happening here. Like that's, we should be like, realize that that's what's going on. But sometimes we need to tell our faces. It's like, do you know what's going on right now? Okay. You just received Jesus. Like you should have two emotions, overwhelming joy or overwhelming like awe, like like sad, like tears of joy. Like I'll have uh, there'll be times when I receive, I come back, I'm I'm just crying. And that that's okay. But there's other times I just can't stop smiling. You know, it's like that's the way that God comes to us in both of those. It isn't the uh, one expression or the other. It's a both end. That's our faith. It's that marriage supper of the Lamb, but it's also at the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. And traditional Catholics, they just remember the traditional part. And a lot of the, the liberal Catholics, oh, it's just the joy. It's not the reverence. It's they go hand in hand together. That's the beauty of our faith. It's like they're not exclusionary. They're both necessary. People yeah. like Mother Teresa, she spent two hours in front of the Eucharist, but then she used that to go out and be joyful. You know, the people who are actual saints, they were able to take the reverence and the joy together. There isn't one or the other. It's not, I'm just a joyful Catholic. I'm just a reverent Catholic. No, it's a reverent 
joyful Catholic, those two together, that we take God serious for who he is, but that so much so that my life is transformed and the only fruit of the spirit is joy, love, peace, gentleness, kindness, self-control that comes with it. And if that's not happening in your life, then you need to take a step back and say, why am I not experiencing any joy? Is it something that I'm putting up? Is it a block? Because the grace is there whether you know it or not. It's the mode of, like Aquinas says, it's that the mode of the receiver is how it's going to be received. So if you're receiving and you're not receiving any joy when you come to Mass, who's doing it wrong? Is it God? It's not God. It's not God who's not in putting that grace and that joy and that love and that peace that comes through his body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's the person who's receiving it. Am I coming with the right disposition to expect and that to happen in my life? This is an important part. As we're talking about this stuff, this can seem like, okay, this doesn't relate to me, but it does, right? If you're yeah. listening or you're watching, yeah. because when Jesus commissioned us to go forth, he wasn't just speaking to the apostles who then became bishops, who who then work alongside priests and deacons, their shoulders aren't big enough to carry the responsibility of the Great Commission. It's on all of us, right? That's the beauty of it. We all share in this. And again, another thing that was 100% Father Maletta's um, uh, vision, we no longer call our parishioners parishioners, right? That's a common Catholic Church term. Uh, evangelicals say members, or we don't call them parishioners. We call them parish partners. And again, it was something that existed outside of church language. It's actually a, a legal term, right? If you're a partner in a law firm, then you have an invested stake in the success of the law firm, right? You have a role in the law firm. So if you're a parish partner here, if you're a parishioner, if you're a member, you're a parish partner, you have a vested interest in the community. And so there are things that you can do. It's not all just father's responsibility to make sure things go well. You have to participate. You have to make yourself available to make sure that the community is doing the best that it can to be the face of Christ in whatever region yeah. that you find yourself planted. Yeah. And there are things that you can do that are like low bar entry. I mean, how many times do you go to a Catholic church, you don't see a greeter at the door? And I'm not saying like a weird way, just somebody that opens the door says, welcome. Hey, thanks for being here. And I mean, you'd be surprised you how, could, how people like, you like do that, that. that like, like I know people who literally like walked into a church and someone was nice to them yeah. that they started, they kept going because the one person was nice to them. And it's not just for the regulars. And that's the what the, the regulars that, need to understand. They're like, well, I don't need someone to tell me welcome. No. Well, it's not about, we should be outward focused. The more inward we're thinking well, about us. I think, and I'm guilty about of this the, yes. too. Like you don't, you don't think when you're going to mass, Catholic mass, that you, there are going to be non-Catholics there. Yeah. If you're doing church right, we're hoping. And if a you're bunch. doing discipleship right, yeah. Yeah. there should be non-Catholics there. There should be non-Christians there. So the impression that just having someone at the door that just opens the door, hey, welcome, hey, glad you're here, thanks for joining us, doesn't have to be. Again, doesn't have to be weird. We have to be normal, right? Being Catholic in its truest is being just yeah. normal, welcoming them in, having somebody on the inside to just usher them through the church. Right, if you're a regular, this is this should be your second home. You should know where you're going. Not that you're locked in like this is my pew. I'm going to get there early so I make sure I yeah, get territorial. No, that's not what it's about. It's about okay, this is my home, but I'm going to be a host in this place. If I invite someone into my house, I offer them the the best seat in the house. Hey, you get the lazy boy, right? You get the head of the table. I'm going to serve you. I don't sit down and, you know, this is my chair and you go offend for yourself, you act graciously. And imagine if we took that attitude. So it's, again, that's not something the Father has to do. That's yeah, something that we can that do. things that we can do. Yeah. So yeah. to have hosts, ushers, that actually extend that welcome and that greeting, help find people a seat, make room for others, invite people into your pew. I mean, dude, again, how many times I go to church and it's like there's one person on this end of the pew, one person on this end of the pew. And then they don't slide in. And they see you coming. I got a family of five with a with a carrier, and they just kind of give you the side eye. And, That's oh, excuse nice. me, can I get in here? They step out so they can keep the end. It's even <laughs> So just this morning, there's this lady who shows up once in a while to mass, and it's like the extreme. So I always sit up front daily mass because I – I just, I like to be close and I keep my eyes closed and I do my prayers, whatever. <laughs> There's a lady who sits, sits always 
like if I'm, she hasn't been coming at 6 a.m. So I think she goes to eight or whatever. I don't know. But she sits where, where I would normally sit. But I'm like, all right, I, she, she gets her really early. But she sits in the pew. I sit there. When it comes time for communion, she doesn't get up. So I'm the first pew. So I'm the first one to go. But she doesn't get up at all. She doesn't get up. Like, oh, so the first time this happened, I'm like, okay, like, what am I going to do? I'm like, I don't know what to do. And I, I've been going to mass for years, you know? So I'm like, all right. So I just go to the next pew. She wants to be the last person to receive. Even though she's the first Even person. Even though she's the first person. Okay. So. Why? So I don't know because she receives on her knees. She's real reverent the whole mass. She's kneeling the whole mass. She's praying like 10 rosaries. Which is great. God bless her. She's great. But like, it's like, I know because I've been there. But so one time I seen her. So then I sit, I didn't sit in the same row. So I'll sit behind her because I don't want to be trapped and I have to go around. It makes it a big weird thing. So I did that. So then some random guy, like last week, sat in that spot where he's blocked in and he's like looking like this. I'm like, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm like, yeah. you know, hey, she don't get up until the end. He's like, oh, okay. I'm like, all right. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. It's nice, you know, nice enough. She'll hand me, like, if there's a novena, she'll hand it to me. You know, she doesn't wave at the piece. She's just like, so, I don't, there's those extreme people, but then there's other people where it's like, hey, you got to notice that you're not, the mass isn't just about you. It's about God and us. It's communion. It's not about, you know, that's one thing I didn't understand when I first became Catholic because I was I had so many things I had I had to work on. So I was so vertical, you know, the, the cross. Oh, yeah, you got, yeah, uh, yeah. It was just me and God. Yeah. But the mass came alive when I realized that I was connected to everybody else. But for some people, it takes a long time. Like me, I was so far, I was a convert, so I didn't have anything. So I needed to really focus on God and me because I didn't know. So, but once I realized, okay, whoa, 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 this whole thing, we're all connected. The mass is about all of us. It's like, it's a communion. That's what it's about. I'm like, wow, that once you had that, that intersection of the vertical and the horizontal, it just opened up everything else. And we can get trapped in that it's just about me. And it's like, that's what people are doing if they're not like, hey, moving in, like sliding over for somebody who's got a kid. Like, you know how hard it is to get a couple of kids together from ass by time you get them up, try to get them some food, make sure they got their shoes on when they get in the car. Um, you know, one's crying. As soon as you get in the car, the other one's got to go to the bathroom. You get here, they're like, they're having, one's nose is blown. You know, it's like, it's a million things. And the, the parents, they took a lot of effort to get the kids there and you get there and then someone's giving you side eye because you had to slide over. It's like, that's not very Christian, number one. But number two, it's like, we want to encourage most churches are dying. And if you see a baby, it's like, that's the life of the church. That's why I love Father Mileto. I hear a baby crying. He's like, yay. Like, he celebrates that. Like, you brought your kids here. Congratulations. We're yeah. not supposed to give them a hard time. We should be making it great for the families. Like, be happy that you're here. You're the future of the church. And if we don't have crying babies, we don't have to move over because there's no room. Like, that's those are good problems. And some people can get so turned inside about me, my spot, and territorial, you know, that it, it can be off-putting. And like, you don't know by doing that, People could be like, I'm not coming back to this place because you did that. Like, that's how big those things are. We don't realize it in, in real time, but like how people are perceived when they come there. Maybe that's the first time they've been in mass for a long time. And I show up with a kid and you don't even want to slide over. Like, I don't want to be in a church where people don't want to be nice to other people. I know I'm a stranger, but like, you don't have to sit there and give me your life story. All you have to do is slide over What's a couple. What's the deal? So speaking of like being in the pews. What's the deal What's with that? The <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be our new thing. What's the deal? That's Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. What is the deal with Catholics sitting in the back? I mean, it's. <laughs> I don't get it. It's a stereotype because there's a shred of truth to it. We come in the Because the last will be first. Is that why? Uh, that's, that that's what I've heard some people say. <laughs> <laughs> Wish we'll take it. You, you do. Like, again, because I'm in the church world, it never fails. And you go to any like, your local Catholic church, it's usually like the altar father, a couple people, empty pews, everybody else. Yeah. What I mean, if you like again, what you're saying, all if, afraid of getting called on or something like it, like it's school. Father's like, not going to call sit, on you because if you not, sat in no front of school, quizzes. people are always worried that you're going to be right up front by the teacher that they're going to call on you. Which, but here's the thing: or you can hide and do other stuff. If you know. go to a concert, if you go to people a show, be up front, if you right. want to, you want to be as close. You go to a game, you you pay extra, yeah. right? The nosebleeds are maybe going for eighty bucks, and. You know, front row is going for front row is going for two grand, and people pay, and it's like you're coming to the quote unquote best show on earth, and you're gonna sit in the back. Not like me. I want to get us. So there's two things that keep me from going up front. 
I do have the kids. Yeah. And so, you're, but I've also heard the opposite of that. Here's like the when thing. you bring the kids, a lot of times that the closer they are, the more they feel no, like my kids do. <laughs> yeah. But a lot, a lot of, I've heard, I, but I've heard a lot of people that that's what they, they would. One time though, my son, when he was young, he took off and ran right up to the yeah. altar. It was hilarious. Yeah, Let not the my children kids. come to me, he said. <laughs> if anything, my kids, especially Jacob, he's going to hang out with Mike in the media room. Like yeah. <laughs> he loves it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's the thing. It's like, okay, I don't go up because I got the kids. And here's why. It's not that I don't well, want to. usually be, doing like church, you know, like. Well, that, that's the other thing. Stuff. Like I, I want to, if I am in church, I try to stay as close to the guys, even though they have it under control. But you never know. They might have to tap you on the shoulder or like you might have to jump in. That's 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 a tangent. I'm saying like as a Catholic dad coming to mass, I want to be mindful that I'm not causing a distraction because sometimes that does happen. Like, well, then yeah, you can excuse yourself. It's okay you know, for it's, kids yeah. to cry in church. No. But if your kid's excessive, because you're, again, it's not just you and God. It's not just you and your kid and God. Yeah, you don't want to. I'm there, here with there's the a, assembly. There's somewhere in there's between. There's decorum. There's somewhere in between yeah. being, uh, you know, crazy, uh, uh, crying so we'll and be, a tantrum. Like, we'll somewhere be sitting in church and it's like, okay, he's got to go to the bathroom. You take him to the bathroom. Because he went to the bathroom, his sister wants to go to the bathroom. Now we're taking her to the bathroom. <laughs> and you're bouncing the baby. So, like, there's practical reasons why. So it's not. But you're talking about people, people without without kids who come there. They just sit in the back no matter what. They'll, they'd rather sit in a folding chair in the back than any then, pew. Yeah, it's like, do you know what's happening on that altar? Yeah. If you could see through through eyes of faith, through eyes of faith, if you had God goggles on, and you could actually yeah. see the Lamb on the altar, surrounded by his mother, the throng of saints, I'd want to be as close to the action as possible. Yeah, yeah I. When I, I've been going to daily mass now almost four years, and I started going in the front row. It's a different mass experience. It's a different. It's a way different. It's a way different mass experience. And then one time, they asked me to. to I'll, I'll do like the altar serving and do the reading sometimes. And the one time, like they had the bells like right on the altar, basically. So I was like this is the altar. I'm like here. I'm like kneeling right here where he's like holding, like I'm like almost, you almost touching me, you know? I'm like that close. I was like, it was like, I was like, it was like at the Super Bowl. That's what I felt like. It was like, it's hard to explain it. But for yeah. me, as somebody who didn't grow up being an altar boy, it was like, like every time still I do, I get nervous. Like, it's like, it's like, I'm part, I'm like, part. I'm like, they asked me, it's a privilege to be part, you know, of, you know, I get to ring the bells and stuff. I'm like, da, 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 da. I'm like, I'm all into like a kid. But to be that close, it's like it's such a privilege. And like, no, he's giving me a piece of the broken host. I get to, you know, yeah. like though everyone doesn't get the wine. I get, you know, he dips it in the wine. I'm like, it's like, oh, it's like I'm like, uh, I want to be as close as possible because I believe. I know that that's Jesus. I want to be that close. So it's like, well, what's causing you to want to be back? What artificial barriers are you putting up? Yeah. Because that's what are you are you afraid of? Are you God? uncomfortable? Are you uncomfortable because, like of like we talked about last week with confession, like spiritual nudity? Are you uncomfortable because of your sinfulness? Are you uncomfortable because you maybe don't believe a lot? Like take that act of faith, that leap of faith. Like no, he wants you to come closer. He was calling you. He wants you to come closer. Not that it makes you any better of a Catholic because you sit closer or worse because you sit in the back. But the fact is you should maybe keep those back pews for the people who are never come because they're maybe afraid to take those first ones. And you do come that, hey, no one's going to bite you. He's not going to hit you with a uh, super soaker up front. He's not going to, you know, Father Mulletta does once in a while do some talking and, you know, it gets real close, which kind of can be weird, you know, for people. I get it. But like for the most part, yeah, you know, you may get on the camera, I guess, you know, but... Most churches don't have that. You Most don't have to worry churches about that. don't have that, but you're missing out if you've never experienced mass that close. Then you should at least try it and see. You know, don't be afraid. You're not gonna. There's no pop quiz. You're not gonna get called on. Maybe. <laughs> Most people don't, but but the kids would love it. You know, the kids. That's what's awesome. Like yeah. when they called up. That was. I thought it was pretty cool how the kids came up for the first communion. You know, around the altar, that was cool yeah. because they get to experience like, no, this is real. This is going to be your first communion. Like inviting them into like, no, this is a big deal. Let's mm -hmm. make it a big deal. They get all dressed up. It's like imagine if we took mass that serious every time, like it was our first communion. You know, preach on. What else is bothering you? What else is getting uh, grinding your gears there? Well, what, what I know is Dima's going to love that Bobby brought back spiritual nudity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she liked that. <laughs> hey, that. <laughs> I don't know where I got that from, but it's not original. I wish I w all my ideas were recycled from somebody else. Ecclesiastes, right? there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah, it's I even if know. you think you're original. It's no, I I'm so saturated in watching and listening to things. I'm like, I don't yeah. know what's mine and what's there. We'll put it this way: there's not a lot of original thoughts. The people who actually have an original idea, 
I mean, most of it could be an idea that you maybe tweak. Oh, they're a rare bit. things. It's like a diamond. Yeah, they're very, there's not a lot, so there's not a lot of Elon Musk. Good. There's just not, those people are rare. They're rare people to have, to think way differently than the way everyone else, because yeah. they're ostracized. Most people come up with a new idea. It's like, especially if you don't have a place to where to kind of test it out and like people are like, oh, that's weird. Like, what do you, what, what? Like, that doesn't make any sense. It's like, you got to get a lot of pushback on new ideas because people are going to test it out, you know? So, so what else is bothering you other than what about, uh, <laughs> Let's, let's go on a rant. You like doing rants. What's really got my gears was the governor of Michigan, Gretchen, oh, here we go. Gretchen Whitmer. Her, uh, she did some crazy uh, TikTok or reel or something with some yeah. pro, uh, pro-abortion activist. Some Instagram influencer. Where if you didn't see the video, it's uh, like just a short little 10 little clip, uh, 10, 10 second, second clip where she, the, the podcasters on her knees and it look, it's real sexual on top of the fact that it's, it's poking fun of it's supposed to be the chip act or whatever they were talking about wanted to vote for, but she didn't say anything. It's just her looking like she's like a priest giving a communion on the tongue to, to this lady with her tongue out with the Doritos. And then it just cuts to her. She's wearing a hat that says Harris uh, walls. And she just kind of does one of these weird looks, but I'm like, number one, very suggestive, look, very suggestive look, very like, like sexual, but obviously making fun of the yeah, holiest like, thing in our faith, which is uh, the source and summit, the Eucharist. But it just got me thinking, it's just like the only religion, the only thing that's left where people are, it's okay to be a, to be bigoted against is the Catholic faith. Like you wouldn't do that to, you wouldn't do that to Muslims. You wouldn't do that to Hindus. You wouldn't do that. But Catholics are the one thing that you can still make fun of. You can still like say all these hateful, Yeah, hateful for whatever things. reason in that ideology, you have to be sensitive to everyone. Except for. Except for Catholics. They, yeah. We get a pass. Yeah. And it's, we get to be the, the Catholic church is always the one they're going to take because the Catholic the Catholic Church has been holding firm to our beliefs since, you know, especially with the sexual revolution and all these things about abortion, the Catholic Church is, has not wavered. You know, say, say you want about the church, like a lot of other evangelical churches, the Episcopalian, the Methodist, they have all caved on, you know, same-sex marriage, abortion, transgender, you name it. They, 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 they're willing to compromise and to be with the world. And the Catholic Church has been there standing firm from fighting back on birth control. Like that was a big thing when Humana Vitae came out with Pope, Pope Paul VI. Yeah. Like that was a big deal. Like Catholics got a lot of like, oh, what are you trying to tell us? We can't have kids and you're telling us None this. of it, none of that. That's so why I saw that video with, with Governor Whitmer. None of it surprises me. Yeah. I'm rarely ever surprised because you know the game plan of the evil one. He's going to attack that, which is true. And yeah. the truth that God has revealed resides in its fullness in the Catholic church. Right, and we talked about this in a few episodes, a few episodes back. Our, the Holy Father had made a comment. There are strands of God's truth because He's created us all and implanted His Word in our hearts because we're made in His image and likeness. Whether or not you're Catholic, Christian, you have God's fingerprints on you, and that's something we can't escape. So there is truth that exists outside of the Catholic faith. Within the Catholic faith and Church exists the fullness of truth, and that's what the evil one wants to attack. So he uses the things of the world to attack us, to deride us, to belittle us. And that's why we're the last acceptable bias and we always will be. But when I, so when I see stuff like that, I'm not surprised. Am I offended? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you don't offend that which is sacred. Yeah. Am and, I surprised? No. And there was a pushback, which wasn't even smart politically because a big deal of, you know, getting Catholic voters, like this isn't like she represents Michigan. It's a swing state. It's a big deal. It's like the timing. Like then I, I try asking these deeper questions like, well, why would she do that? It's not smart even politically. Like they're courting all these Catholic voters in like Pennsylvania. There's like 700,000 voters. They're trying well, to swing. It's like, yeah. why, like why? Is, even like if they're, they're not even smart politicians, yeah, you, it doesn't are, make sense. Yeah, pride is so strong. Yeah, We're blinded maybe, by our own pride. Maybe that's what it is. We're but blinded, it doesn't. it's not smart yeah. politically. It's not. But when you think... When you think your ideology is that which is true, even though it isn't, you can be filled up with this false pride that causes you to do these types of things that you're blind to. And you're your own worst enemy in that regard. And so the the attacks of the enemies, yeah. the attack of the evil one, it's first and foremost, 
it's subverted by the cross of Christ. It's overcome by the cross of Christ, but it's also by their own weakness, which is pride, right? They, yeah. they are their own worst enemy in that regard. And so they'll do things like that, that they think because they're in their own bubble that, oh, that's going to be, oh, that's smart. That's creative. Oh, that's going to be a, it's going to be viral. And but when it gets out in the world and it's brought into the light, that's why censorship isn't a good thing. Yeah. When it's brought in the light, all of a sudden there's this backlash and we see things. Bishop Barron did this really good. Uh, what was, what was the issue that there was a, like a fake apology? Oh, about the last supper of the Olympics. Thing. Oh yeah. The Olympics thing. She, Governor Whitmer did the same thing, this fake apology. It Not wasn't apology, even like, oh, apology. I'm sorry that it offended you. Yeah, it was like, no, it was actually about, it was a coincidence that it, it mirrored the, the communion act. It was really about this chip act. Nobody knows what the chip act is. Everybody knows what communion and, and, is. And no one thinks like Doritos like a chip. You would use like potato chip if you're going to do that. You know, like a Dorito is not like, yeah, it's a chip, but I wouldn't use that as a chip. I'd, no. be like, I'd use like a barbecue chip or a plain potato chip. That doesn't even make sense. Yeah. But yeah. these false apologies, like, no, I'm sorry, you got to do better yeah. than that. You got to, if you're going to be prideful enough to fall into that kind of trap that you've set for yourself, to get out of it, you actually have to show that we talked about confession last time. You have to show actual contrition. Hey, I'm sorry, I screwed up. I, yeah. I didn't mean to do that and issue an actual apology or else it's just yeah. fake. There's, well, a, there's a, a lot. Lack of there's just there. a lot of that. I really would like to do maybe to do like maybe do some short segments and go through. I know Katie and I were talking about doing it on the Catholic couple, but just going through some of the stuff. Because we should be kind of trying to warn people and letting them know, like, there's that new movie that's coming out called Conclave. Conclave. And we we were at a movie. We saw the trailer. We're like, it looks, I was actually I'm like, like, man, this looks cool. It's uh, like they got Ralph Fiennes. They got all these awesome actors. Stanley Tucci, who's great. Yeah, they got uh, all these. It's called Conclave. So this is going to be don't see it. We're going to try to give you all the spoilers so you don't see it because there's a, it's based on a book from 2016. So we know what it's about because... People have read the book and there's all kinds of reviews, but it looks awesome. But it's kind of like the same thing, what they did with like Angels and Demons and Da Vinci Which Code. Which I still haven't seen. Which I saw it because I, I, want, I was curious. Like I'll see it so I can talk about it. But like Angels and Demons, it's like there's this whole thing with, you know, but it's making the church look bad. Like the Carmelengo is the guy that's in charge of like when a Pope dies, when they have a conclave. He coordinates the conclave. He coordin yeah, he coordinates the conclave. So in Angels and Demons, he's like the bad guy. Like he becomes like, he's the man mastermind who's killing people and doing all this stuff. That's the movie. So in this new movie, Conclave, it's like they got they got John Lithgow. They got all these other guys. I'm like, okay, I'm starting to see. Before I'm I watching, seen it, before I read, I knew what was going on. I didn't well, know see, it was going to be that crazy at the end. I'm it's, watching the trailer. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, I'll go see this. This looks, looks good. amazing. I know they're going to do something creepy. But in the or back of weird. my mind, I'm like, you this know. is going to be bad. Like this, there's no way this. Comes so out what I good thought what it was going to happen is because you have all these different. So like the premise is that an unnamed pope dies. So kind of like when John Paul I dies, there's this, you know, ooh, there's it's always like a palace intrigue yeah, story. Yeah, because it's 33 days. And 33 he was, days. Was he poisoned? Was, was he, he poisoned? Yeah, all this kind of stuff going on. So that's kind of how this is set up. And this up. actually happened. This actually happened. So it's like, oh, this is how this is set up. And then I'm thinking, okay, so this, what are they going to do? They're going to do, oh, traditional guy, bad. This new progressive guy, good. And then there's someone in between, like, working it. Like, so that's like par for the course. Like, that's how Hollywood is. They get all these actors to come out. John Lithgow, you know. If that's how lame the storytelling that's how is. Usually if you lame just, the, if you can if you know can what it's about it, before yeah. you even, it's like, of course. And it's like, okay, so I, I, I could get that. Okay, cool. Like Pharisee, the guy's like a traditional guy. He's like real super, fa you know, Pharisee guy. And yeah. the other guy just wants to bring hope and change, you know. And then the, there's the there's outsider comes in out of nowhere who which in the story, we're giving you all the spoilers so you don't see it because I read reviews and I read the uh, synopsis of the book. So then here comes this outside person who became a cardinal, not the normal way, not the way that you can, which you have to publicly announce that you're a cardinal. So when he was dying, they found a letter written by the Pope who died that said, this guy is a cardinal. So then they let this guy in. He's from uh, Kabul, uh, Afghanistan. So he gets into the College of Cardinals and he's part of this con conclave pro process. And of course, he becomes the Pope. This guy who wasn't even supposed to be a cardinal. And of course, new, uh, drum roll, drrr, he's intersex, transgender, really a female. Like, who would have thought? Who would have knew? Like, of course, it's like, I didn't think they're going to be they're that crazy of like, but I want people to know, like, this is what the movie is. It's not about the Catholic Church. It's about they're trying to push an agenda on people that... Traditional people are bad, you know, 
priests can be women, intersect. They try to use these weird little. Was these, this person a priest prior? Yeah, and the and the and the pope that died knew. So, and they really wanted him to be a cardinal. And then that's why it all happened. And there was a lot of like, you know, going back and forth behind the scenes. But it's like, talk about jumping the shark. It's like, I knew it was going to be like, hey, th these traditional guys are bad and these guys are good. But like, but really, he's a, has female genitalia. Like, that's the whole thing. It's like, I mean, come on. It's so lame. It's so lame and stupid. So, here's where so it, don't waste your time. It makes it even more lame. I told you this. When you actually look at the history of the Catholic Church, right? There's so much scandal. Cool story, like real stories you could tell that are true well, stories. Well, I wasn't going to say cool, but, but like, like <laughs> when you talk about scandal. Interesting. I don't know about cool, yeah. but it, interesting, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not even talking about like the last 20 years or so with, which well, is Benedict tragic. stepping down, they can make that look kind of, ooh, it's the banking controversy. And like, yeah. like there's all that kind of stuff. You can tell real we, stories. We literally, we actually, in the history of our church, we had a pope unburied yes. the previous pope and <laughs> put, him on put, trial. put his remains on trial. Yeah. Like th there's- We got some cool stuff. That's cool. We had a pope that resigned. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. We, yeah. Had, we had a pope that resigned whose successor imprisoned him. Like there's stories like that. So why do I say that? Well, first of all, we are a church that was instituted by Christ, that's protected by the Holy Spirit, but that's run by men. And so it's and, amazing. And it's been fallen from the beginning with Judas. Let's, it, let's put it in context. Yeah. The so, first bishop, one of the first bishops who knew Jesus. Betrayed, betrayed Jesus. Him, period. And so because men and women are involved in this, there's always going to be scandal. There's always going to be falls from grace. There's always going to have that. We're never going to escape that. It's never going to be perfect here. And so we should never expect it. Um, we don't have to go too far into Hollywood to find interesting and intriguing stories. Yeah. And here's what these, the actual stories revealed to us. If we were just built on the backs and efforts of men, we would have crumbled a long time ago. That's just like news. civilizations that came before us. Yeah. The fact that we're still here millennia later and going strong is a testament to God and gives glory to him because without him, this would have crumbled. Yeah. So the fact that we can have popes unbearing popes and all these things that we just talked about, these ridiculous things that have happened and that will continue to happen, and yet we're still here, it's God that's guiding this ship. It's God that's keeping us strong. It's God that's moving us forward in the future. And it's God who wants us to look back so the, the, the conservative isn't bad. It's the same God that inspires the progressive who looks forward. Like it's, it's that tension that and, both they and— They need to work together. Yeah, that keeps the church strong. And so— these stories are just ridiculous. There's plenty of actual stories that they can use. Oh, there's plenty of stories. But it's not just the, the but people from within. But if you tell the story. Look at all the enemies outside the church. Like there's a lot of stories like people, there was a story of, of a guy who wanted to become Catholic. He said, whoa, whoa, before you do that, go." he was a businessman. He's going to go do some deals in the uh, Renaissance time to go to the Vatican to do some business. So he goes, whoa, whoa, before, don't convert yet. Go there and see what's going on first. And he comes back. He's like, no, I want to convert. He's like, you seen this? You seen this? He said, yeah. He's like, there's no way that this church can still be standing if it wasn't divinely inspired. So it's like we survived the Romans, the Napoleon, yeah, Hitler, yeah. Russians, like the... The invasion the of the Huns, of Rome. fall of Rome. Like it's, I mean, just go through history. Islamic there's conquest. There's a million things that is still standing. It's supernatural, period. It, amen. amen. Like, amen. just full stop on that. Um, Dima and I showed Dima, we watched Remember the Titans yesterday. Oh, okay, great movie. Which is like a phenomenal movie. Such oh, a good it's great. Movie. It's on Disney. Disney uh, Plus. Yeah, that's where we saw it. So we watched Remember the Titans, and then afterwards, I, Dima's not really big on stand-up comedy. She likes some stuff. Nate Bargatze is uh, pretty good. He's funny, yeah. Sebastian's got some good stuff. Maniscalco. But, uh, oh, I love Nate Bargatze's stuff. Like, I'm on a rabbit the, hole. The only two stuff. funny skits that Saturday Night Live's had in the last two years is Nate's his, stuff. The George Washington. Oh, my God. Those are I've hilarious. watched them like five times. I can't Have you stop. guys seen these? Yeah, well, the one, the first one, on the, he, boat. the yeah. first one he did was about words, and yeah. then the second one was, about, or the first one was about numbers. The second one's about words <laughs> so in the English good. language. Oh, it's so great! Please, if you're not, if you haven't seen those, finish the podcast and go watch them. Yeah, because <laughs> they're, oh, they're so, and it's clean. Like, he's a clean comic. Yeah, yeah. the fu the funniest part was about the. He's like, yes. And because they're they're gonna win the revolution, and he yeah. says, uh, "Yes, and we'll have two names for animals: one for when they're alive, and one when we eat them." <laughs> He's like, "So cows will be beef, pigs will be pork, 
but chicken will be chicken. <laughs> he's like, sir? Yeah. He's like, yeah. He's like, so he's because all these crazy things about the English language and our numbers and how yeah. things are crazy. It was just, it's just good, clean, fun humor. That was great. Uh, so you're watching the stand up. Sorry. Um, so, yeah. Where was I going with that? Oh, Shane Gillis. Oh, he's funny. Too. I love Shane Gillis. He's <laughs> not clean. Just no, full he, disclaimer. He's a maniac. Yeah. It's, uh, it's something you watch with headphones on, especially if you have kids around. But uh, he had a skit about Remember the Titans. And uh, it's about racism. Like how, how they introduce uh, blacks into college or high school sports and college sports. And he goes, well, people think that things are bad when it comes to racism today. You know this country fought a civil war. Like where the North had to go down South and just shoot racism out of the <laughs> Uh, it's so good but it's like that's this applies to the church like for people that get nervous about you know pope francis or what he's saying or what's coming out of the vatican or the state of the church today we're closing churches this that like it's been worse know that a lot worse it's been a lot worse it's been better there's times when the church has been better but the church ain't going nowhere no. and if you get worried and anxious are you placing your trust in god are you seeing him as the one behind the church moving the church? Yeah. Are you placing the power of men who we're just, I mean, Ecclesiastes says we're just mist in the wind. We're here for a little bit and we're gone. He's the one that actually reigns and rules over all. So who are you placing your trust in? And so I don't get as worried. Like, again, yeah. if stuff happens in the church, if if a, a new ruling comes out, if, 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 uh, um, a hot mic from the Holy Father gets people yeah. stirred up. It's like, I don't get worried because I know who's in charge. Speaking of getting people stirred up, I just, the stuff that else has been um, <laughs> getting me going is the whole canceling Columbus. Like trying to cancel Columbus. And, well, I mean, that's been going on forever, but. But it's so, like my background. Not forever, it. but it's. My it's, background it's is recent. history and I'm also part Cherokee. So I can speak a little bit for indigenous people. Uh -huh. I'm not uh, that much, but like <laughs> 10, 15% I'm Cherokee. So. Uh, Don't get me started on the indigenous people thing. Well, indigenous it's and. Okay, we're really like. <laughs> we're going to get there. So, so but. The, but, but. The, I, I, what I would encourage people to do is to read the primary source. Mike's so going to cut our mics. That's all right. Read the primary <laughs> He's sources. He's going to pull a presidential <laughs> right. debate on us. Yes. And just say, hey, yes. uh, Bobby, uh, Khalil, uh, yeah, uh, your mics uh, are cut. Uh, mics are cut. But go and actually read the, like, I'm a historian, so that was my background. So if you want to know what's going on, read the primary sources. Read the, the, the like, you want to know what's going on during Jesus, read the Bible. That's the closest. And then the closest to that would be the people who were, you know, the first people in the church who were, like, you know, disciples of the disciples. The closer you get to the source is always the better. True. We're going to get the best information. So with Columbus, a lot of people don't know this about Columbus. They just think he's such a bad person. But there's no primary sources that say that. Like, newsflash, slavery was already going on, not only in the New World, where they were at. Like, literally, when he showed up in the Dominican so Republic. So straw man your argument. Yes. Wouldn't the primary sources be written by the victors so they're going to paint Columbus in a good light? That's always who gets to write the history. history so again, is always, if I go back to the primary sources, well, not and always. I'm trying to look not, up not on Columbus. always. Well, look at um, like the round. If you want to study, what, know what happened in the time of Jesus. There's also you have Josephus and Tacitus. So you have the winners. The, the Jews actually lost. Josephus was writing about the the, the destruction. Well, I know there's of the primary temple. sources and secondary sources for Jesus. Yeah, but like on the Columbus thing. Well, you, you can read back. his own diaries. So you, you hear his word. He wrote a lot of diaries, um, but. Even like people who came at right after Columbus, Bartolomeo uh, de las Casas, mm -hmm. who wrote the, a book called Defense of Indigenous People. Who was a priest. Who was a priest. He wrote, he said, really the atrocities didn't start till like 1504 where people started to do worse things. But when he showed, when Columbus showed up in the Dominican Republic, the people that were on the island were the ones that gave him slaves and he took them back to, uh, to Spain. So like he didn't go round up people. Like there was already slavery going on for thousands and thousands of years. That was the norm everywhere. It was the Christians who mostly the English were the first one. Wilber Wilberforce were the ones who started to literally not trade with people because of slavery. They were trying to abolish slavery. Christians abolished slavery, period, and stop. The second thing about Columbus, what a lot of people don't know, is that he wanted to take, he wrote letters to the to the king and queen to take some of the money that from the gold that he wanted to use that to take back Jerusalem. 
Like that was like one of his main things. He was a devout Catholic who literally went there to spread Christianity. He wasn't going there to try to find the new world. Like they didn't even know, like he had an idea of where he was going. They didn't think they were hitting India. They didn't think that that wasn't a thing. They knew, they already knew Marco Polo went through the, the Silk Road. They knew a little bit about that, but he literally wanted to take the money to, he wanted to spread Christianity and he wanted to retake back Jerusalem. That's yeah, part that of the money. Yeah, thing, again, yeah, there's so many things we can talk about on this. <laughs> well, have you ever but, seen Apocalypto? But, but to Watch make Apocalypto. It, oh, that one's freaky. Watch Apocalypto. And that'll yeah. give you an idea of what was going on with what Columbus yeah, showed up. Yeah, that's freaky. Like, that's one of the best movies I've seen in a long time. And it's it's... It's, it's not freaky. It's that was the it's, state before Christ. Yeah. That was what how people lived their life. And, and that's these what people, I mean by freaky. It's a little, these people yeah, it's are going on in the in the tomorrow. in the thirteen, fourteen, fifteen hundreds. Yeah. They were doing these things that were going on in the Old Testament. Like literally, the the continent so, was still doing the Old Testament. To stick stuff. on Columbus because there's so many tangents we can go on. Right oh, now. let's go with the Columbus thing. That whole thing about him thinking he found India because he called the natives who he found here Indians, which Indians, Indios, Indios means Indios in God, means in God, in God, like the people in God, Indios, yeah. and it's somehow through our our retelling of the narrative, we teach people that oh he called them Indios he because he thought he, he, thought he, he found he, India, yeah, and they were brown no. colored people, and this is just a that colonizer that's happened. coming. No, it's not what happened. He, he actually refers to them as a people in God. So that tells you the reverence with which he held the other person. Yes, was there slavery? Slavery was ubiquitous for that time. Yeah. We can't apply our moral standards on a people that came yeah. before us. Just like people who will come after us, hopefully, have a moral standard that is more elevated. I don't know, it's a little shaky, but that's a little bit more elevated than what we're, we're living today and what we're experiencing today. Well, the other thing is they, they they came spreading disease on purpose. Like the microscope wasn't even invented yet. They had no understanding of microbiology yet. Like they didn't come, oh, we're going to give them blankets full of disease. Like they didn't even understand the way that bio, like microbiology worked and diseases and stuff. They were barely figuring that, those kinds of things out. It's like, no, that's what happened. It's, but they when, thought it was like a curse. Like they thought like, but like sickness was like a curse. Yeah, like they, they didn't. They, understand didn't, the they didn't have an it. understanding of it. But when you get mass movements of people from one area to the other, they don't have the same antibodies. So as somebody who's got Cherokee heritage, yes, yes, um, not offended at all. What <laughs> what does the term Native American mean to you? I, I'll refer to George Carlin. Have you ever seen Thank that George, you. That's the, what I'm the thinking George of. Carlin? There, Again, there another are, comedian, are, great bit. You know, a lot of f words, but there are oh, no Native yeah. people in any land. Yeah. Like the people who are Native America came over the land bridge from Asia. Like all, the, the people of Mexico, you're not Mexican. You were part Native American. You were part like Indian, Mayan, Altec, Aztec. And you mix with the Spanish. Now you have Mexico. Like everybody's mixed. Like people in America, like they're French. There's all these different people from all over the world. Africa, people, you know, from, you know, they, they left the diaspora, went through Northern Africa, mixed with the people. Like everybody's emigrated from somewhere. Everyone's moving. There is no native There's to There's no any native to any place, anywhere, any, like even the Inuit, they came over the land bridge from probably Japan. Like everybody where you're at, like somebody moved there. And that's just part of what goes on. People move all the time. And there's obviously war and conquest. And like you said, the winners write the stories and nine tenths is, uh, the possession is nine tenths of the law. It's like, well, some people overpowered these people. It's like, but if we're going to go back and rejudicate all this land based on who was there first, it's like, well, were they really first? It's like, you got to, how, how far, far back, back do you go? How far back in history are we going to go? Because every land has been conquered by one person or another person. And now there are people that are there. So there are no natives. That's the, that's the moral of the story. Unless you were like in the cradle of civilization. So here's, okay, here's where the Catholic filter comes. Over the top? Over, over top. So through which we see this. It's okay that there are many nations on earth, yeah. right? Jesus doesn't abolish nations. He tells us to go out into the nations. Mm -hmm. But God's design is that there are many nations. God does two things. He either directly wills something or permits something to happen. Yeah. So either God directly will that there be a proliferation of tongues, languages, cultures, peoples, etc., nations, or he permits it to happen. Either way, it's in his will. And so in its in and of itself, it's a neutral thing. So there's going to be diversity, which we can celebrate, right? There's nothing more that I love than traveling and getting to experience another culture. I mean, you get to just see people for who they are. We Like we went to South Korea, uh, part of our honeymoon. Like that's a whole other part of the world. 
I didn't know that. It's amazing. Oh, dude, it's amazing. Wow. Like the people were so kind, generous. The food was amazing. Just getting to take in their culture. So like to experience other people's is amazing. God's design is that we all be united in his church that covers and extends beyond boundaries. Yeah. It's okay to have but boundaries. But he didn't say to abolish the nation. He didn't state. say to abolish them. He said them. go to all the nations. No. Knowing that there are other nation states. And they didn't have an idea of genetics when the Bible was written. You weren't Jewish because you had this certain genetic makeup. You were Jewish because you, you celebrated abided by the, the commandments. Because you were circumcised, you celebrated the Passover. Yeah. You were part of the people because you practiced what they worshipped. That's mm -hmm. how you became Jewish. And so that's God's that's design. With Christians, the, doesn't matter where you're at. You're, in the you're plenitude baptized. of nations, we are united yeah. in him. Yes. We aren't united under a constitution. We aren't united yeah. under within boundaries. We aren't united because of a creed outside of that which we profess, a faith in a God that's created us. Yeah. And there's something beautiful about that. And so I, I lament when you hear like, oh, they were just coming here to force people to be Christians. Well, no, it, it, it is in the Christian's nature to want the best for other people. Yeah. Not by force. You can't coerce somebody into that, Christianity. That isn't how it but works. But we're called to share the good news. Yeah. We're called to invite people in a relationship with the God who made them. And yet it, it's gotten, again, looped into this narrative, just like with the Indian thing, into this like colonizer narrative. When in fact, Christianity came out of the Middle East. Christianity was in Africa and spreading before it even made it to Europe. Yeah. Like, again, let's know our story because in knowing our story, there's strength. Yeah. In knowing and our story, not there's misrepresent, logic. Let's not mi misrepresent the story because you're trying to push some kind of narrative. Yeah. Like you're trying to make it sound like it's only a white thing. It's like, no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a lot deeper than that. It's like, why does everything have to be that? You know, every, everything has to go, to go to that. But I think with part of what the issue is and why we're having so much breakdown in society is because there aren't these overarching narratives and stories that are holding us together. And when the, the gospel holds every tongue, every nation under, because everybody's made in the image of God, there's an overarching thing that's holding us all together. Same with within your nation state. You got, you know, you got laws, you got borders, you got language, you got culture within South Korea, or you're in America, or you're in Jordan, or wherever you're at. You Everybody has, there has to be something to hold everybody together. It's like we're Roman Catholic, it's different than Byzantine Catholic yeah. or whatever. There's these the, the language, culture, practices, and laws. I mean, that's what holds people together. But God never says, let's abolish the nation state. Dude, we do the, I, I just realized right now, I'm laughing. You see Trump was on Andrew Schultz's podcast. Yeah. And he was talking about how he gives speeches. Oh, he weaves, does the yeah, weave? Yeah, he weaves. Yeah, we do the weave. That's what we do. We got to just try to bring it, bring it back <laughs> We're together. We're just sitting here weaving. So I'm yeah. thinking like how... Let's weave it back. That's why a strong church is important, not just for, for us personally. Yeah. It's important for the world. Yeah. And that's why your parish, which is the epicenter, right, locally for you of the church, has to be strong yeah. because the world needs it. The world needs strong parishes. And, and strong podcasts because the podcasters are taking over the world right now. <laughs> well, we need good Catholic podcasts. Yeah, because look look at the impact that podcasts are having in the oh, world. Oh, sure. Trump and Kamala, I mean, now, because the people are- Are they going on Rogan? They're, bo true? they're both supposed to, but I don't think Kamala- Is she supposed to? She, I think she, she wants to. She said that they offered it, to, but do you think she's going to sit down a two, three hour unscripted? She just did a Univision, uh, uh, like local, like, what do they call them? Uh, town hall. Yeah. And Univision zoomed and turned around, and then you see the camera, and it's got a teleprompter. So all the questions were scripted, and she's reading from a teleprompter in a town hall. Like- you know, that's, it's kind of weird. So do you see her sitting down with Rogan? Who's not going to like give her the questions. There's not going to, you know, he's, he's Rogan. He just, he just not. does. But, but look, Trump, Trump, uh, she, but to be honest, he was on call her daddy, I'd love for her which to be, is, uh, I'd love for her to be on Rogan. I'd love for I, him I would to love, be on Rogan. Because I, it, I, it should be three hours of asking yeah, tough questions. I just want to know what you have to say. Yeah. But then, you know, you you look and see one side is open to whatever. Ask me anything. Like JD Vance every single day is going on, on, you know, hostile interviews. It's like every candidate should have that same scrutiny. I want to know what you actually believe. Like, hey, what are your policies? Not what's wrong with Trump, not what's wrong with Kamala. Where do you stand on this? Where do you stand on this? And like, not like, well, I was born in a middle class family and I was on a farm, whatever, whatever that may be. Like, let's get to the brass tacks. Like, what what are the things? I want to hear you talk and think. Like, you're the leader of the free world. You're gonna be the leader of the free world. Can you put together a thought and like articulate what it is that you believe? You're you're literally representing us, we the people. 
to the rest of the world. Like, if you can't do this to, like... Dude, a carton of eggs at Aldi is $3 now. What are you going to do to make that come yeah. down? Like, that's what I care about. You're messing I mean, with my gains. You're messing with my gains. <laughs> <laughs> messing with my gains. Make... You know, make groceries affordable again. I mean, it's crazy. I'm like, go to the grocery store with hundred dollars, see what that gets you. Like two bags of gar uh, groceries. You know, it's it's crazy. And I know it's not just about economics. I mean, we can debate politics back and forth. We obviously lean more traditional, which is fine. Um, you can vote whoever you want. We're not telling you who to vote for. We're just giving you our opinion. But podcasts have been a big part of this journey because a lot sure. of people aren't getting, the only people who are the boomers are getting their news from Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, and maybe 257 doing their local Cheers, news. Sean Ryan was the number one podcast on Spotify. Yeah, because he, he How did. How did that happen? He had. Good for him. So look at Trump. Trump went on Sean Ryan. He went on Andrew Schultz. He went on Busted with the Boys, went on the Nelk Boys. He went on. He go, uh, Ivanka was on Lex Friedman. Like they're going on all these, where all the people are at, like most people who are our age are listening to podcasts or YouTube channels. And now Kamala, she did call her daddy, which is like a, a What's sex, gonna be, uh, sex so podcast. Let's maybe as we're wrapping up, um, we even talk about robots, dude. Ah, uh, next one. We're not wrapping up anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> I got another podcast to do tonight with my wife. She, um, she's gonna be very happy. What do you think comes after podcasts? Like nobody would have, nobody knew podcasts were gonna be a thing 15, 15 years ago. Well, part of the what right? have you guys seen all this like in real life streaming stuff? Yeah, I feel like that's kind of coming up next. Twitch, People, yeah, Twitch. It's just gonna be like in real life. Like you're gonna sit and watch me live my life. It's gonna be like Truman Show. Dude, there's a movie it's like Truman about Show. That. That's so weird. Truman Show. There's a movie about that where, like, uh, I think what's her name, uh, Emma Watson. I think it, it's that circle. The movie The Circle, where oh, she yeah, like, yeah, yeah. goes fully transparent. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, That's yeah. Like, I mean, people watch podcasts to like connect, right? Like yeah. connect with that person, learn something. Of course, if it's a learning. I don't but understand they, that. Help like me. You. Help me understand that because I I'm not into that stuff, but I I'll get like little clips of it. Like they just sit in front of a camera, yes, yeah, so and like called, live their life. Like it's just, it's just following on. them around. Yeah. It's just on all the time. The camera's just on, like while they're like doing if they're cooking whatever. dinner and they're just talking. They're just like living their life with a, like on a live stream. Yeah, it's like you're, and that's gaining traction. Oh, the Twitch, huge. Twitch is big. Yeah, like um, huge. And you know what? You know what? Most of it is is people playing video games. Yeah, yeah, Twitch is people want to watch other people play video games. Like the kids are crazy for it. That I knew, but like, it's weird. Well, like, I mean, it's I'm not playing a game. I'm just like, watching you play a game. Down. Well, it started like it's video games and watching that is still a huge thing, but it's now developing into this like storylines where and... people want to watch you, who's putting on the camera on their, themselves, like live their life. It's like and, transparency. Yeah, like, it is like transparent watching you. Yeah, do I mean, this obviously, and this and like really, but it's yeah. crazy because weird. It went from, you know, there was such the bandwidth had to do with like, that's why they like most arguments, they never get flushed out because it was like, you're in a three minute segment on, if you got on, you know, Fox News or if, you know, if you're a stand up comedian, you got on Johnny Carson, you got that two minute clip, and you were like, change your life. But now the bandwidth, YouTube's made it free. Everybody can put anything out anytime. Like now, if you're good and you're funny and you, you're you captivating, you got good editing skills, you can get out there. Like before, it was like such a tight that's niche to get in That's different than what there. they're talking about, though. Why well, in that's the world like people, I just oh, want that's to watch just, somebody are, live their... Well, if there's somebody who's like uh, interesting... I think it's weird too. I, I think, oh, it's super weird. Yeah. But if somebody's like interesting, you know, I can see it. But if I'm someone's just playing video games, I don't know. But people want to live plus people are living vicariously through other people because they don't want to, they don't want to, they're afraid to leave their house or they don't have friends or they just want to be somebody else. They like to live vicariously through other people. I don't get it. So, Hopefully they're not getting that here. Hopefully we're 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 having some fun, we're some trying arguments, to provide some and value. Try to, pro, providing some value, um, some education, hopefully. So my ins, my YouTube algorithm on shorts, <laughs> if you were to go through my shorts, it's usually like lawn and garden stuff. <laughs> Um, I'll get always Catholic stuff will come up or like, you know, Christian debate stuff, all that stuff comes up. Um, but something that'll pop up and I saw like, I, 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 I like got sucked into it mindlessly. It was somebody just crushing chalk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Like they were just crushing ASMR. chalk in their hand. It's ASMR. It was nothing like the, yeah. the whole shot, Mike was just like, they were crushing chalk okay. And I'm like, I'm watching it. And I didn't realize I was watching it. 
And then I caught myself. I'm like, am I really just watching somebody crush chalk? So I clicked on their channel. They had 27,000 subscribers. And all their videos was just the same them crushing chalk. And I'm like, what is the, what does it say about people? That they've got 20, 27,000 subscribers just crushing the, chalk. Was the audio of it like really... No, it wasn't. It wasn't like ASMR. It was just oh, like okay. literally. Just crushing just, chalk. There was another channel that came up. Somebody's just polishing a rock. <laughs> They've got hundreds of videos of them polishing the same rock. And they'll polish it like a oh, day one of polishing the rock. And they'll just like scrub the rock, polish it, and then they'll put it down. Oh. You don't see anything but the rock. And I'm oh, like, minus. it's again, not Dwayne I, Johnson. It's an actual rock. I saw, yeah, the actual <laughs> rock. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm like, people, and that one had like tens of thousands of followers. Well, what does it, that say about us, dude? Well, I think a lot of the other videos that are really big are people opening stuff. So we're real consumeristic, capitalistic, yeah. like kids, awesome. like they, what, the, the kid Ryan's toys. He just opens up toys and like kids just watch him open up toys. He's got, he makes like $27 million a year just opening up toys. Like literally, it's one of the biggest YouTube channels. That's what they do. How was that kid's mental health and well being? Well, he's great. He makes twenty seven million a year, but like that doesn't all the, mean anything. But all yeah. it does, all the kids, like all the kids, want to buy these things. They give them free stuff. They open it up, so every kid wants those things. What kind of adult is that person going to be? He's going to be a rich kid who's going to oh. do whatever he wants. Uh, money aside, like what does but, that do to the kid? But that's what's that what's doing it on the bigger level. It's 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 training people to wanna to want more to get more to do those. I things. agree with you, but I care about the but person. I think, it's like, what but is I that? think podcast why it's good is because we never had this opportunity for people in long form to flush out ideas. That's why I'm hoping that uh, Trump and Kamala go on Rogan yeah. because it takes sometimes to get going and to get your thoughts thinking and to bounce them off other people to actually know what. I don't you, know. What After you I saw Rogan and The Rock, speaking that, of The Rock, oh, that seemed real. Rogan, well, because they had beef and they never even talked about it. Well, here's the thing, though. Rogan was really, he Tone wasn't down. challenging. He wasn't Yeah, because they got a workout in beforehand. He, he gave him some talent. Still, I mean, you know he's working out. Yeah. Well, that wasn't the reason. No, they worked out together. And it was very unlike Rogan. Usually he's one asking Mushroom. questions, just listening. He didn't turn it into mushrooms? He spent like 90% like, of the Every conversation thing somehow gets turned into mushrooms. <laughs> like no matter, what, no matter what he could be talking about. Yeah, but what about mushrooms in the cross? So if he like does that? have them on, I hope he doesn't do that, where he's just talking the whole time. Well, he's done good with like, you know, he had Bernie Sanders on before. He had Tulsi. He had, you know, just this week he had on, um, who did I just watch? It was good. Oh, the, my favorite one so far, what I'm really going down the rabbit hole with. Those two doctors? Yeah. Dr. K, Dr. Casey Means and yeah. Dr. Callie Means. Yeah. Because that's the most important thing other than our spiritual health is our physical health. Because obviously, you know, the statistics coming from that, you know, just that shows that. 70% of adults are pre-diabetic mm -hmm. or diabetic or obese, 50% of our kids. Autism now is one out of 36, one out of 22 in California. Young adult cancer is up 79%. And their big push is the guy Callie means is who hooked up RFK and Trump together because they're on this platform to want to make America healthy. And that's been a big thing for me. Like in my house, we got rid of everything. Pla like I've been on this kick for a while. Like I'm drinking out of stainless like no plastics got rid of all the plastic tupperwares all the you know the the, the non-stick pans everything stainless steel got rid of all the you know the the plastic spatulas getting rid of like like my kids now know like hey when hey can we get this they're looking at the you ingredients know even these stainless things have plastic coatings on the inside they, everything does but there's certain things that are this is a little bit better it's than like that's, that's yeah <laughs> feels like but that yeah, does defeat the purpose i just out of a the like cans split. on the inside, yeah, that's what they do. Yeah, but it, it's it's but it's there are some things like burning candles inside is bad, like spraying. You know, there's so many. There's some things that are going on in the world, and if people can't see that people are not very healthy. Like where I work, like they're all people. The, the food is like there's over. You know who I want to talk to? This is, now Bobby and I are really just... Oh, we're getting going. We, we're we've talking about this. all structure. Yes. Yeah, we probably should wrap this one up. But yeah. We, we can who's go that priest that's like... He was at Mr. Olympia. Oh, Father Capo? Capo. That's who it is. Yeah, I he was, at, he, was, that he was at Olympia. Yeah. He sounds. He looks like an interesting guy. Yeah, Seabo You know who retired. else we could probably have on? I'd love to talk to him again. Father Rob Gallia? Yeah, get he him was, on. Were you here when he came to no. the parish? No, but I heard he was good. Yeah, he's fun. And he's got his own podcast. If you guys want to check him out, Icon. I think that's the name of the podcast, but it's Icon Ministries. 
So yeah, I think he does really like Catholic stuff. influencers or something in his podcast with two two women. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So he's got some fun stuff to say. Yeah, and he's into working out and taking care. Well, our body is a temple. So, but there are some factors that we're literally like people just are not uneducated, like about, and these two doctor, the the one was a lobbyist, one's a doctor, and they go through and try to explain, like, you know, we're these company, the companies and the food companies, the FDA, they're all working together. They're funding each other. Like they come from the inside. But it's just like, it's hard as a person living in this world to know. There's well, so they're much creating the problems and owning the solutions. That's the problem, isn't it? And Monsanto it's all, it's, and Bayer, one is, is causing the cancer, one's got the cancer uh, curing drugs. Yeah. It's like, it's a conflict of interest. And that seems to be everything. Like everyone works for the government, for the FDA. Then as soon as they retire, they're working for the companies that they're enforcing. It's like, it's, we don't know. And I think that's what, RFK and these people are speaking like there's something wrong. We don't know what it is. We just want people to try to put a finger on it and like protect us people. Like we shouldn't be worried about our food poisoning us and killing us. Cancer, young people, cancer's up 79%. I, I, everyone, I, I know a lot of people who have cancer at my age, having heart attacks, having like, this We're is not autism normal. Autism is like one in 36 now? It used to be one in like 1,500, one in 10,000, some studies. It's one in 36. In California, it's one out of 22. So there's something going on with our metabolic health. Di Ozempic is about to be the, the biggest drug in the world. Like we're trying to sell to people that, you know, there's a pill, there's a magic, you know, our faith teaches us there is no magic thing that makes everything better. Like, no, it's sacrifice. It's denying yourself. Discipline. It's, all, it's discipline. It's all these things. It's grace. But it's not some magic pill or shot or prayer that you're going to say that's going to be better, you know, but that's what... You know, they tr try to say that's all Americans want. We're just lazy. We just want the quick fix. But like, no, we'll people just that. want. We'll solve we'll that solve problem solve that on the next, next episode. One because we want people. What are you to guys around. talking on your podcast with uh, Katie? Catholic so, couple. so to give you a tease, so I found the marriage hack of of, of a lifetime. It's been working wondrously for our marriage. Not that we're perfect, but it's been getting a lot better. It's walking. well, you can't walking. You just, uh, what kind of tease is that? You just, just a gave tease. I'm not going to give you all, what, why? <laughs> what? Obviously, you take walks with your wife and it's helped your marriage. Like that. Yeah, but it's a lot That's like a trailer than... that gives too much. It's all right. The Catholic couple. <laughs> when I release Talk it. about the Catholic like, couple. You know it. <laughs> Great stuff. You guys have a good time together. Uh, this was fun. Yeah. I, 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 I was getting bogged down by the sacraments. I love them. But... Are we going to have uh, Katie and Dima on the show? Should. That would be fun. I think be for fun. for the marriage episode. Yeah. Well, they got some time to prepare. We got to still do the Eucharist, confirmation, then marriage. So just, let's let's get cool. them lined up. We need a, a couple priests. We need to get a, a priest on. If you're a priest or you know a priest that you think would be good, let us know. Tag them. Um, we'd love to, to holy have orders, our, our, our confirmation, or Eucharist. We'd like to have uh, another priest. Yeah, we're, we're, Father Declan's pretty busy. He's on mission right now, in Mexico. Yeah, they so. come back. They're like an hour out, so oh, cool. they come back today. All right, oh. close up in a prayer. Yeah. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Come Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of laughter. Thank you for the gift of conversation and friendship, fellowship. Lord God, we wish to glorify you through all that we are, say, and do. May we be icons of your Son who's, uh, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks for watching. Take care. God bless.